Okay, so um, it's exactly two o'clock. So I think uh, um, we would like to start on time. Thanks everyone for joining us uh, for this physics department colloquium uh, in remote form. Um, so as some of you may know, we're trying to have a rather broad ranging series of colloquia and public lectures. Um, part of the plan was to reboot these colloquia with uh, you know, new talks designed to bring the department together in person. But thanks to COVID, of course, all in-person events this year aren't happening. So um, we're moving all talks and public lectures online. And I'm very pleased to say that we're kicking off this series with a talk that I think uh, uh, will be of appeal to many, many people in the department and all uh, sort of physics of fundamental interest in my own field of condensed matter, but uh, which has broad implications for our understanding of quantum materials. Um, and the speaker is one of our own colleagues, uh, Seamus Davis, who's, I think, uh, beaming into us from Ireland at the moment. So Seamus uh, really technically doesn't really need any introduction, but uh, while we always say that, I'm going to give him an introduction anyway. So he's a leading researcher in the field of superconductivity and the properties of correlated materials. Uh, and he's a pioneer in using scanning probe microscopy, scanning tunneling microscopy to understand the properties of high temperature superconductors. So he's done a broad range of work uh, across uh, thinking about how, uh, various types of high temperature superconductors and more recently thinking about topological phases of matter. Um, you know, his CV is long and he's uh, been all over the world. He did his undergraduate work at, uh, in Ireland um, and then moved uh, to Berkeley where he uh, did his, uh, where he received his uh, degree and w was eventually on the faculty for several years before moving on to um, various places in the, on the East Coast of the United States, including Brookhaven National Lab and Cornell University. But just a few years ago, we were very lucky uh, to entice him back to this side of the Atlantic, where he's founded a group doing very interesting uh, research in the basement of the Beecroft Building, and also distributed doing other interesting work in at University College Cork. So Seamus has had a wide variety of honors, you know, a slew of uh, important early career fellowships, uh, and more recently has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences and has been awarded, and particularly relevant to this talk, is he's, uh, if you look at his CV, he has three prizes named after pioneers of superconductivity and superfluidity. Uh, the Fritz London Memorial Pl Prize, the Kamerling Owens Memorial Pl Prize, named after the discoverer of superfluidity, uh, superconductivity, and the Oli Lunasma Memorial Pl Prize, named after one of the pioneering high temperature um, I, sorry, pioneering low temperature physicists from Finland. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Seamus who will uh, give the, uh, the talk today. And just to lay out some protocols for how we'd like these uh, Zoom talks to work, I'll ask that once Seamus uh, unmutes himself and presents himself and starts sharing his screen, we're going to ask everybody else to uh, maybe uh, turn off their video so that when the recording is there, we just have the speaker and the slides, if that's okay. So today's talk will be recorded and maybe shared to members of the department and others. So, and uh, if you have a question, you can use the raise hand feature in the chat, or if there's a point in the con uh, in the talk where there's a pause, no. you can unmute yourself and chime in. Um, if there are, uh, and so if I'm going to, if, uh, everybody can turn off their video. I think some people have a uh, video on, but are absent. So if people can turn off their video, uh, I'll ask uh, Seamus to start sharing his screen and kick off his talk. Okay, hi everyone. Um, hope everyone is safe and well. Uh, you and your families and your loved ones. These are strange times and this is a strange colloquium, but uh, I hope we can make the best of it. And I'm sure that things will improve and we'll be back to our normal way of life sometime next year. So just hang in there. Uh, so today my, my purpose is to discuss um, visualizing an, a fairly new state of matter, electron pair crystals in a conducting quantum spin liquid, which you'll find out is actually a fairly old state of matter. Uh, first of all, what's an electron pair fluid uh, slash crystal? Well, 
um, electron pair superfluid is just uh, what people like me call a superconductor. Uh, Kamerlingonis discovered superconductivity in 1911. It's a state of a macroscopic quantum state of electrons in which a material can have zero resistance to electrical currents, infinite conductivity, perfectly dissipationless electrical and electronic characteristics. It's an extraordinary state, and this discovery is one of the most important in physics, in my opinion. Uh, superconductivity is not an obscure phenomenon. Not magnetic, go superconducting at a low enough temperature and at different pressures. Superconductivity is not restricted to temperatures near absolute zero, painfully low temperatures. It was when I went to graduate school, which is someplace here in the 1980s. But in the last several decades, the critical temperature has zoomed up steadily, going above 100 degrees Kelvin for many compounds. In the last five years, it's gone above 200 degrees Kelvin for hydrogen-based compounds. So um, this is not an ultra low temperature. I mean, you know, 300 Kelvin, that 300 Kelvin is a higher low temperature, it's just a human perception. But there's nothing specifically low temperature about superconductivity. It apparently, in principle, can happen at any temperature. Uh, last week, last Wednesday, uh, Mikhail Aramets uh, reported uh, carbonaceous hydrogen sulfide is superconducting at temperatures above room temperature. So the, you know, Century-long goal of reaching room temperature superconductivity was reported in Nature last Wednesday. This is a spectacular achievement. If you want to bet on somebody to get the Nobel Prize, you can just look at this slide and make your own judgment. Um, however, although this uh, superconductor is superconducting at ambient temperature, the pressure at which it superconducts is above 250 gigapascal. And so the only place on our planet where that's an ambient pressure is in the core of the planet about 3000 kilometers below the surface. So at present, this extraordinary superconductor is still not available for utility or any applications. And that means there's huge opportunities remaining to achieve room temperature superconductivity at ambient pressure and ambient temperature in economically viable materials. For young people listening to this presentation, I urge you to turn your attention to that question. It's one of the most important in condensed matter physics right now. All right, how does superconductivity occur? Imagine you have a degenerate gas of fermions, electrons. They're free particles, so they have a momentum to wave vector relationship, de Broglie relationship, and they're non-relativistic. So energy goes as P squared over 2M. There's the energy momentum relationship. The electrons are in a crystal though, and the periodicity of the crystal um, interrupts the, or produces a periodic structure in momentum space. And so the famous energy gaps in the band structure open. Now, when we um, uh, allow free electrons to fill up the eigenstates from the bottom of this band, if there is an odd number per unit cell, then they'll fill to some inter intermediate level. Uh, this is the energy of the last field or the first empty fermionic state. It's called the Fermi energy. And it also picks out two momenta, the Fermi momenta. So that's super. Um, this beautiful state of matter, which is the state in which virtually all metals are, is actually unstable. It's not the ground state. You can show, at least in BCS theory, that there is a lower energy state always. And that energy state occurs when uh, electrons of opposite momentum and opposite spin bind together to form a bound state. If you're a high energy physicist, you can think of this uh, like positronium, but it's got two electrons instead of an electron and a positron. And then all of these bound electron pairs condense into a new macroscopic quantum state, a superfluid of charged pairs. And that completely reorganizes the electronic structure of what formerly was a metal into a situation where there are two types of phenomena. So one are the quasiparticles. The original band crossing the chemical potential disappears and a new band of single particle excitations called quasiparticles appears. And at the same time, the fluid of condensed pairs also appears you can think of its chemical potential as being at the original chemical potential. That's a good way to think about it. And this fluid is some product state over all possible pairs. So you 
you know, a superconductor is not just something that conducts electricity without dissipation. It's a combination of two classes of electronic excitations, quasiparticles and electron pairs. Now there's one other wrinkle in this amazing story. Suppose you could split the Fermi surface uh, by spin so that the wave vector for spin up was different than the wave vector for spin down. But then when you would bind these two electrons together, the sum of their two momenta would not be zero, it would be a finite value. So now you could make a bound state of two electrons in a, in a singlet spin zero state but the center of mass momentum of this object would still not be zero. It would have a wavelength. Um, if you condense these objects, finite center of mass momentum pairs into a new co condensate, it's not a fluid because it breaks translational symmetry. It has the same wavelength as the uh, de Broglie wavelength of the pair, and it periodically modulates the condensate of the electron pairs throughout space. So it breaks translational symmetry and it modulates the superconductivity periodic, periodically. You can think of that as an electron pair crystal. Um, that's the way I think about it, but the, the, the uh, standard name for it is a pair density wave state. So this state of matter actually was predicted in the early 1960s by Fulda, Feller, Larkin, and uh, Ovchinikov. And for more than 50 years after the prediction, uh, there was no direct detection that this state existed in matter. Uh, so most theorists believe in this state, but um, logical positive experimentalists would have had their doubts without direct observation. Okay, now let's look at the other side of the coin here, quantum spin liquids. Think back to what you learned about a spin a half electron in a magnetic field. Um, the spin a half, because of the Zeeman splitting, the spin a half electron whose Hamiltonian is here, Pauli's Hamiltonian, has two eigenstates. So one of them is the spin up eigenstate parallel to the field. It's got the lower energy, it's this one. The other one is the spin down eigenstate. It's opposite the field, so it's high energy, this one. And these are the two eigenstates of that Hamiltonian. But of course, the system, the state that the system is in is any spinner that can be represented on the block sphere. So it could be a linear superposition of the two eigenstates, including a phase factor. So, you know, a spin a half uh, locked on one side is already quantum mechanically a very complicated object. Now let's think of a crystal where there's a spin a half on every side. Of course, crystals have all different symmetries and the interactions between the spins, uh, this is the Heisenberg form of interaction. It's just a dot product of the spin operator on one side on the next. You often see this interacting lattice of quantum spins represented in a picture like this. I've never found that very compelling because it misrepresents how complicated the problem is. This is a much more realistic picture. There's a spinner, a quantum spinner on every site. Each one is interacting with its nearest neighbor, second nearest neighbor, third nearest neighbor, and so on. This sum can become incredibly complicated depending on the crystal symmetry depending on the sign of the exchange, the, the sign of the interaction energy, and depending on how many terms you take, just nearest neighbors or second nearest neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's an enormous number of possible states that, that you know, occur for interacting qu quantum spins. There are ferromagnets, antiferromagnets, but there are also states where quantum fluctuations overwhelm the ordering and they do not order magnetically. They remain non-magnetic fluids, non-ordered magnetic fluids, and they're called spin liquids. So a simple way to think about how a spin liquid could happen is just by considering two spins. Imagine two adjacent spins and um, they're going to form an entangled state. So two spins have a total of the total spin of these two spin halves has, has four possible eigenstates. We'll just consider one of them. It's the total spin zero eigenstate, which is maximally entangled, the so-called spin singlet state, which Einstein really didn't like, but which John Bell demonstrated is a key characteristic of our universe. If we represent this spin singlet eigenstate of two electrons by this symbol here, now we can think of a fluid of those objects a fluid of those singlets, but it's dynamical. So the, the hybridization this way would be changing in time and so on. It's a dynamical spin system. 
Uh, but nevertheless, it's a fluid of singlets and it's an insulator. That's a nice cartoon for a quantum spin liquid. And now you could turn this into a conductor. You could take away a few of the electrons, leaving holes behind. And that would allow hopping of the electrons. You would end up in a situation like this, where you have a mixture of spin singlets and uh, charged spin charged holes with a spin half. And somehow this mixed fluid is believed to be a conducting quantum spin liquid. Now, um, there are, sorry, there are, uh, there are example, there are candidates for this state and there are candidates for this state. So a famous candidate insulating quantum spin liquid is ruthenium chloride. It's been studied very intensely for the last five years. It's believed at high field that this is a quantum spin liquid at low temperatures. And the candidate for a conducting quantum spin liquid is CU, whole doped CuO2, which I'm going to talk about in detail uh, in the talk. So for those of you who are interested in the long-term study of quantum spin liquid, you know, where is the field? So first of all, many people would like to know, do squ quantum spin liquids exist? There's really no definitive observation of this state. And if they do, what would be a positive definite signature of a spin liquid? Then what are the key materials? If they exist, what are the quantum numbers of the quasiparticles? Then, you know, fully detailed theory, including transport theory for these magnetic fluids. And finally, the one I'm interested in is, you know, do quantum spin liquids form new ordered states of matter? Okay. But this is a red hot topic in quantum matter research all over the world. Uh, you, you can see topical reviews coming out you know, month after month sometimes, uh, because this is uh, one of the frontier problems in quantum many body physics and in quantum matter research. All right, now let's talk about CuO2. Uh, this is the material which produces copper-based high temperature superconductivity. So if you take a plane, uh, which is just made of copper and oxygen atoms, so the copper, so copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen, the coppers are in a 3D9 state. So all the D electron states are filled except one. The 3D dense, the 3D10 state is empty. And because of the crystal field symmetry, the spatial symmetry of the orbital with one electron in it is dx squared minus y squared. Now the adjacent atom is oxygen. It captures two electrons and closes its 2p6 shell. So to first order, it's inert. Now the reason why this is an interesting compound is that the energy to doubly occupy the copper site, that is to put the last electron into the copper atom is three electron volts. It's enormous. So there's no way an electron can hop from one side to the next and they get frozen in position into a, it's actually a so-called charge transfer MOT insulator state. Now that state, uh, there's still an interaction between the electrons. It's a second order um, antiferromagnetic super exchange interaction. And if you solve the Heisenberg-like uh, Hamiltonian using that spin-spin um, interaction, you'll find that the ground state should be a correlated antiferromagnetic insulator and our colleague, um, Radu Caldea showed very beautifully by neutron scattering that indeed the ground state of CuO2 is a beautiful ordered antiferromagnetic mod insulator. So that's good. Uh, one thing to think about is that the super exchange energy is enormous. In Kelvin, it's like a thousand Kelvin. So these magnetic interactions are among the strongest of any spin a half material that we know about. Okay. But now let's think of hole doping. This is obviously not a superconductor. It's a high gap insulator. We want to turn it into a superconductor that's done by doping with holes. So the do to dope the holes into this system, you need to remove an electron. Now when mother nature designed this material, she put, here's the lower D band. This is the filled D orbital. Here's the upper D band, the empty D orbital of copper site. She put the oxygen uh, energy levels of the 2p6 states in between. So if you want to remove an electron or inject a hole in this compound, you have to do it on the oxygen site. So doping involves removing an electron from the oxygen site. When you do that, it makes some local quantum mechanical state, which at least I don't understand, and I believe nobody understands. This object becomes delocalized. And when it does, you get a completely new phase diagram. So the density of these doped holes, we call P, 
Uh, so here is temperature, doped hole density. If there's no holes, it's an antiferromagnetic MOS insulator. If you have say 20% of holes per, per unit cell, then it's a robust high temperature superconductor, which we actually understand very well. But suppose you have say 5% of holes, then there's a huge state here in the phase diagram, which has gone unidentified now for more than 30 years. Unfortunately, it's called a pseudo gap state. It, what it should be called is electronic dark matter. It has resisted identification for almost as long as dark matter. And that's because it is a very strange state of matter. It is not a metal in my opinion, and in the opinion of many of the world's leading theorists on this subject, it's widely believed to be a whole dope spin liquid. So the super exchange energy, which was making the antiferromagnet didn't disappear by just putting a few percent of holes into the crystal. What's believed to happen is the super exchange energy allows adjacent electrons to form very robust spin singlets. And then those singlets uh, form a uh, spin liquid. And then when you dope the holes in, the spin liquid becomes conducting. So the conjecture among all of these truly genius theorists is that this is a whole dope spin liquid. Now there's a fly in the ointment. In fact, there's hundreds of flies in the ointment, uh, which is that experimentalists have found that this phase is a broken symmetry phase. It breaks rotational symmetry at Q equal to zero and it breaks translational symmetry in some kind of a density wave state. So now you have grounds for at least cognitive dissonance and perhaps tribal warfare. These colleagues may regard the broken symmetries as irrelevant and these colleagues may regard the spin liquid as irrelevant. Uh, but you know, in a rational world, there is another possibility. It's that this state is a symmetry broken whole dope spin liquid. So of course, that's only a plausible possibility if a uh, solution of the Hamiltonian for this phase shows that such a state could exist. All right, so let's consider the strong coupling Hamiltonian for doping holes into CO2. It's got two dominant terms. One of them is the super exchange, magnetic, antiferromagnetic super exchange that I told you about. And the other one is the hopping. Once you have holes, electrons can hop around through the material. This Hamiltonian is called the TJ model. It's not solvable analytically, but it is solvable numerically. You have to project out every time an electron tries to doubly occupy a site. And you have to maintain the intense super exchange uh, magnetic energy without forming an antiferromagnet. Um, but when you solve that problem, you often find the solution is a D-wave superconductor. Nowadays, that's not a surprise. The solution to this Hamiltonian usually yields D-wave superconductivity. However, less well known is the fact that a, a very frequent solution nearby in energy is a pair density wave state. So when you solve this Hamiltonian for the band structure of this compound, you often, and many different groups have done this using different techniques, you get a situation where the electrons pair, but the pair field modulates in space, let's say with eight unit cells. I'll tell you why I said that a little bit later. When the pair field modulates in space, space, the spin modulates, I'm not gonna talk about that. The charge modulates, I, I'm gonna talk about that. And the density of electron, this isn't the density of electron pairs, it's the order parameter of the pair density wave state. The number of pairs per, per square meter, the pair density modulates with this periodicity. You see this periodicity and that periodicity are predicted to be different. Okay, so here's a cartoon. We made a cartoon of what are the elements contained in the prediction for pair density wave theory for the cuprates. So it's modulating from left to right. So start here, this is a singlet, it's a D wave singlet, um, it's robust, but its amplitude is going to modulate smaller and smaller, reach zero, change sign. Changing sign of a D wave singlet is the same as rotating it by 90 degrees. So here you change to the negative amplitude, and here you change back to the positive amplitude. So in an eight unit cell periodicity, the sign of the order parameter changes once, the spin density modulates once, and actually the charge density is maximum here, 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 and here, it modulates twice. So this is the object that uh, starting around 2015, our theory colleagues started to bug the experimentalists saying, does 
a strong coupling pair density wave state exists in the cuprates. And you should think about the context of that question, right? This is more than 50 years after FFLO was predicted. But still, no technology had been developed where you could tell whether a material has a pair density wave inside, um, inside its crystal. So does a strong coupling pair density wave exist in this class of compound? Well, we had to develop new techniques to find the answer. So we turned our attention to scanned Josephson tunneling microscopy. So conventional STM, you take a metallic tip, let's say tungsten, it's got one atom on the end, you bring it within a few angstroms of the surface you want to study, then apply a voltage between that surface and the tip by grounding the tip typically, and a tunneling current will flow and you can measure the tunnel current. So now if you take the derivative of the tunnel current with respect to the voltage, DIDV, from theory, we know DIDV is a function of V. So measure I as a function of V, take the derivative, DIDV as a function of V is related to the density of electronic states in the material at this location, N, as a function of E. So this function tells us the density of states as a function of energy here. Javer got the Nobel Prize for this in the 1970s. So for spectroscopic imaging, what you do is you measure the IDV at position R, at this atom, as a function of V, and that gives you the density of states at this atom as a function of E. But then you want to do it at every atom. So here's lithium iron arsenide. There are some 10,000 atoms, lithium atoms in this field of view. Each fine dot there is a lithium atom. You measure the, the IDV spectrum at every location. You get an atomically energy resolved map of the density of states. So it's different in every energy. So when I run this movie, time is energy. So as time is changing, the energy is changing. In the same field of view, the density of states is very different at different energies. When we first showed these movies, they were very hard to publish because people somehow believe that um, the electronic structure of crystalline materials is like it says in Ashcroft and Merman, but it's not. It's actually like the Battle of the Somme, usually. They're highly, dis even in very pure materials, there's a tremendous amount of electronic disorder. However, Mother Nature had a secret for us. If you take this movie, of the spatial modulations of the density of states and just take the Fourier transform of that movie. You get this movie. So this is the Fourier space representation of the electronic structure. And it's beautifully ordered because there are only a few eigenstates at each energy. This image, for example, is an image of the Fermi surface in this compound derived by taking the Fourier transform of a real space image. That's called quasiparticle scattering interference imaging. So all of these techniques when studying superconductors study these single, these quasiparticle states. These are single electron-like quasiparticle states. Um, and they, they don't provide any information about the condensate of pairs. So they're tremendously powerful, flexible. Amazingly, they reveal secrets that people had no idea about, about quantum matter in solids, but only for the quasiparticles. So the recent question which has emerged is, if you visualize the pairs, the electron pair field, what would you see? How would you do it? Okay, so here's a cartoon of what you would do. Suppose you take a metallic tip, which is not superconducting. It's only got single electron eigenstates in it. As you scan it over the surface, it'll measure approximately the density of single electron eigenstates in the surface. But if you take a superconducting tip at low temperatures with only electron pair eigenstates and use Josephson tunneling at zero bias, then as you scan it over the surface, the Josephson current should measure the density of pairs. That's the concept. It's an interesting idea and people have had it for some decades. Technically, it's very difficult. If you consider a Josephson tunneling model between the sample and the tip, here's the last, and now this is a superconducting tip. Here's its superconducting order parameter. Superconducting sample, here's its superconducting order parameter. Here's a tunneling picture. The Cooper pair in the tip can tunnel to the sample. Cooper pair in the sample can tunnel to the tip. And there's a barrier of thickness D, a vacuum barrier between them. Now, Josephson showed that the pair current, the current of these pairs from one side to the other goes as some magnitude times the sine of the phase difference. But how big is the current? 
Well, um, you can solve this using a tunneling Hamiltonian, and you can deal with the barrier thickness here and the work functions by rolling them all into the resistance of this junction. And you find out that the magnitude uh, of the Josephson current can, uh, maximum Josephson current can be derived as I naught times the junction resistance is proportional to the amplitude of the superconducting wave function in the sample times the amplitude in the tip. Let's assume the amplitude in the tip is constant. You, you need that to make a microscope. So now if you square these two numbers, I squared, R squared, and measure them as a function of location, you should be measuring the superfluid density in the sample. That was the plan. You can calculate how big is I naught Rn by using the famous Ambigaukar uh, Baratov equation. It tells how big this product is if you know what the energy gap of the superconductor is. And typically, you know, 10 Kelvin superconductors, that's one millivolt. So ICRN, one milli electron volt. So ICRN would be 1.5 millivolts. Now, typically the junction resistance for an STM is a giga ohm. So if I divide down by a giga ohm, I'll find a Josephson current of some pico amps. And if I calculate how much energy that represents, it's equivalent to about 30 microkelvin. So the reason why you can't buy a scan Josephson microscope is to do what's shown on this slide here, you'd have to have a machine working at 30 microkelvin. Even today, that's impossible. Uh, but Mother Nature is generous, although you have to be clever to uh, benefit from her generosity. So if KT, the temperature, is much bigger than the Josephson energy, and that's the situation we're in, even at 30 millikelvin, KT is a thousand times bigger than the Josephson energy. If KT is very big, the phase difference between the two superconductors is fluctuating wildly. However, what you're interested in is the average of sine theta for those fluctuations over time. If that average isn't zero, then there is some Josephson current. In the late 1960s, uh, Ivanchenko and Zilberman described for a low capacitance junction how that could happen. You can apply a very tiny voltage, a few microvolts. If you do that, then the, although the phase is oscillating wildly out of control, the mean value of this function is not zero. So there is some electron pair tunneling at the tiny applied voltage. And mathematically, the electron pair tunneling is related to the Josephson critical current squared times a constant, which has to do with the electromagnetic impedance, uh, controlled by the voltage applied to the junction. And this is another constant. It's actually the constant at which this current is maximum. So I can take the derivative of this function and find what is, and, and this function is shown here, there's no current and no bias, but at finite bias, there's a strong, well, there's a modest pair current. So the value of the maximum current you can derive, it's related to the Josephson current squared. And that's the key thing. If you measure this maximum pair current as a function of location, it goes as I naught squared. If you multiply by the junction resistance squared, you should be able to visualize the superfluid, the, the pair density in the material. And that's the objective of our machine. All right, now how to use it for CO2. So this is the question our theory colleagues asked us just five years ago. Actually, there was a meeting at KITP and this was one of the predominant questions. Why can't experimentalists tell us whether there is a pair density wave in the cuprates? So does a strong coupling pair density wave exist in the cuprate phase diagram? So to answer that question, we need to be able to visualize the cuprate electronic structure. This is a cuprate superconductor. We need to be able to visualize the electronic structure with atomic resolution. So we need scan Josephson. We're going to visualize the pairs, but we need atomic resolution. Uh, even with the famous IZ result, we still need to operate at millikelvin temperatures. So we need a dilution refrigerator-based scanning tunneling microscope. Mohammed Hamidian built this one. It was the first one in the world that worked properly. Um, and to drive up the energy gap in the tip and also improve our signal to noise and also allow tunneling of Cooper pairs, since the superconductor is D-wave, we need the tip to be D-wave. And we achieve that by touching the surface of the crystal with a tungsten tip and exfoliating a nanometer scale piece of BISCO onto the surface. We can show that we still have atomic resolution after that piece is adhering to the surface. 
And we can show that it's superconducting because it doubles the energy gap. Two delta from the sample and two delta from the tip adds up to four delta. So with this recipe, we could make a D-wave high temperature superconducting uh, scan Josephson tip. Okay, now if we take this tip here and begin pushing it close to the surface, as we decrease the normal resistance of the junction, uh, we see this little branch and here, these are just microvolts. We see this little branch appearing and soon enough, we see a clear branch within a few tens of microvolts of zero with a sharp maximum in the, in the pair current. And the superfluid density is supposed to be that maximum mapped as a function of location multiplied by the junction resistance squared, which we deal with elsewhere. And this um, test experiment was done at 50 millikelvin. And what you see here is the electron pair current imaged with atomic, well, detected with atomic resolution. Okay. So for the experts in the audience, here are the parameters. The experiment is done at 50 millikelvin. The tip gap is 25 millivolts. We have nanometer resolution. The junction resistance, we had to push down to about 10 mega ohms. That was extremely difficult. And we have 256, 256 resolution. So very close to atomic resolution. Uh, now we're going to image the, the maximum current here as a function of location. So if we take this field of view at 50 millikelvin, it's a large field of view, 750 angstrom square. But if you look carefully, you can still see individual atoms. If we image the maximum pair current in this field of view, it looks like this. And this is one of the first images ever made of uh, the pair density in, in any material. Certainly, I think the first atomic resolution image made in any material. And it's shockingly vivid. We were amazingly surprised to see how much variation there is in the Josephson pair current as a function of location. And we have dealt with that. We have forced the normal state junction resistance to be uniform here. So this purports to be an image of the electron pairs. Now, you know, when you make a new device, a new telescope, a new microscope, you take a photograph, you know, in science, your colleagues, your referee can say, well, can you prove that this actually is an image of the electron pair density? And that was tough. Uh, so how could we validate that we're actually imaging the electron pair density? So, you know, the cuprates is a fairly mature field and there's a very well-known effect called the Swiss cheese effect. If you put a zinc, a single zinc atom on the copper site in these compounds, it destroys the superfluid density in a droplet of radius about one nanometer. That's been known for 25 years, okay? From beautiful MUSR experiments. I mean, nobody doubts that this is true. So we wanted to use this as a test. We asked uh, Isaki-san, our colleague in Skuba, to put zinc atoms on the copper site. And we can find where the zinc atoms are in the crystal because there's a big peak, a sharp peak in the density of states wherever there's a zinc impurity state. And now here's a simultaneous image of the pair current and the single electron quasiparticle current. There's a zinc atom here. There's a zero in the pair current here. There's a zinc atom here and here. There are two zeros in the pair current, here and here, here and here, etc. Correspondence is excellent. Wherever you put a zinc atom, there's no pair current. And this is the a priori reason to believe that this is an image of the pair density. So, Let's assume we have achieved to visualize the electron pair density in a, a, a proposed whole dope spin liquid. It's got a huge amount of activity. If you're an expert, you could look here and see that it's modulating periodically in two directions in space. So if we take the Fourier transform, we see four sharp peaks. And those four peaks are occurring at wave vector zero a quarter of the unit cell which means they're modulating in real space with a four unit cell periodicity. So here's what we construed this experiment to mean when we first succeeded. We measure the density of electron pairs. It modulates in space with a four unit cell periodicity. So this is consistent with these two pictures are consistent with each other. But for this really to show that we have a pair density wave, there's two other facts which should also occur. So if the pair density is modulating with a four unit cell, the energy gap should modulate with eight unit cell periodicity. That's required by the theory. 
And furthermore, if the energy gap is modulating with eight units cell periodicity, the single electron charge density should modulate with four unit cell. Every place where the gap is zero, there should be quasiparticles here, here, here. There should be a density of states with four unit cell periodicity. So we have checked this effect, but not those two effects. And they're the next ones on our list. So to consider this effect, gap modulation, we went back to our uh, superconducting tip technology, but now we used uh, not the Josephson pair tunneling, but the single electron tunneling at high voltage. So this is at a few tens of microvolts, this is at 50 millivolts, but in the same field of view. So now let's image this energy difference. Why would we do that? Well. If the, dense, if the density of states has two peaks in it because it's a superconductor in the sample, when you use a superconducting tip, this spectrum is convoluted with the equivalent spectrum in the tip to give two peaks in the, in the quasiparticle tunneling, which occur at an energy separation, gap in the sample plus gap in the tip multiplied by two. So if we measure this energy, which we can do as a function of location, it looks like this. So this is energy gap between, we're actually extracting this value, energy gap between 25 and 60 millivolts in this field of view uh, resolved with atomic resolution. So now it doesn't look very good, but you can you know, look at the raw data and see what's happening to the gap as we travel along this line. So here is density of states plotted on a color scale, distance along this line plotted here, and energy on this axis and the distance between these two sharp peaks is two delta sample plus delta tip, which is a constant. So this means the gap in the sample is modulating and it's approximately eight unit cell periodicity. So if we take the Fourier transform of this image, it actually has four sharp peaks in it. And those peaks occur at one over eight zero. The Q vector of the gap modulations is eight unit cells. So that was really good. That means this piece and this piece of the puzzle are solved consistently using the same technique and they're consistent with an electron pair crystal. So how about the last piece? The last piece is particularly awkward because you know, you're looking for charge density modulations, but there's a bazillion reason why you can have charge density modulations in a crystal. We needed some way to control uh, the charge density modulations, which might be being produced by the pair density wave. That's the question. Are their charge density, charge density modulations consistent with being produced by a pair density wave? Now, it is known in these compounds, two things are known. So one is this is temperature and this is intensity of charge modulation. If you go down in temperature and you start increasing magnetic field, the charge modulation gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Secondly, we know for our own work that this effect is happening inside the superconducting quantized vortices. As you increase the field, you get more and more vortices and that and inside each vortex, there's a translational, there's a modulation. So we wanted to use this effect to find out is the charge modulation in here consistent with the pair density rate? Uh, luckily for us, Daniel Lachterberg had solved this problem in 2015, and he predicted the signature of a pair density wave in the charge channel is two modulations. One occurs at the wave vector of the pair density wave, and the other one occurs at twice the wave vector. So this uh, pair density wave modulates the charge for a pretty simple reason, because the gap crosses zero uh, twice in every cycle. But if you're a Ginsburg-Landau person, it does so because there's a, there's a Ginsburg-Landau functional where you take this order parameter, product it with its com uh, complex conjugate, but at the same wave vector, and uh, you can construct a charge density modulation, which is allowed in Ginsburg-Landau, which occurs at 2q. That's a fact. Uh, now, if this pair density wave exists, coexists with a superconductor, there's another possibility. You can take the product of the superconducting order parameter and the pair density wave, the product of this and that, and it produces a modulation at one Q. So there should be two charge modulations, one of them at the periodicity of the pair density wave and the other at, half, uh, at twice its Q vector. So there should be two peaks in the Fourier transform of the charge density. That's the bottom line. That's what Daniel Achterberg predicted. 
So here's an image of the surface of BISCO studied near one Kelvin at zero Tesla. And here's an image of the same field of view studied at almost nine Tesla. And these two experiments were done a month apart. So that gives you a feeling for the type of stability we need to do these experiments. We can tell the images are different actually because there's one atom here that moved during that month. If we subtract the two topographs, we see that one atom did move. But what we're going to do is not subtract our two navigational images, but subtract the electronic structure with the magnetic field on minus the electronic structure with the magnetic field off and find out what charge modulations were, in, were induced by the field. And here's the result. Here's an image of the charge modulation induced by the field. Take the Fourier transform. Uh, here is the quarter zero point. So that's four unit cell modulation, but there's four more peaks uh, at, with eight unit cell modulation. So there are two sharp peaks in this image of charge density. If I take a cut through the Fourier transform, I see one peak here and one peak here, exactly as Achterberg had predicted. So now we believe that the third leg of our stool, the charge modulation signature of pair density wave has been detected. Good. So the pieces at least of this question have fallen into place. Uh, that's, um, that's all I'm going to tell you about the new physics. Now I'm going to discuss uh, the possibilities uh, for future, what it means and the possibilities for future research and what we're planning to do in our new labs at Oxford. All right, so here was the motivating question. Okay, in whole doped CuO2, which is believed to be a whole doped spin liquid, if you take the strong coupling Hamiltonian, as well as a D-wave superconductor, it predicts that there should be a strong coupling pair density wave state. Um, starting in the early 2000s, but really accelerating about five years ago, theorists were pressing on everyone in the community to find out, does a strong coupling pair density wave state exist in this part of the cuprate phase diagram? And now we can answer that question, definitely it does. In the class of compounds we study, all the key pieces required by the theory are all detected independently uh, by more than one laboratory. So we're very confident that there is a pair density wave here in the underdoped cuprates. And so that's definitely a step in the right direction. Do can the pair density wave state exist? Absolutely. All right, now let's think about the bigger, the meta question. I motivated the whole dope spin liquid question by saying this unknown phase of electronic dark matter, possible explanation could be that it is a pair density wave. Now, in support of that argument, there's a number of very powerful uh, observations. So first of all, we know the energy gap in the spectrum of single electron excitations in this phase. There's a large gap in momentum space near the edge of the first Brion zone, periodic with the crystal. And there's no gap whatsoever in the middle of momentum space. There's some kind of an arc of metallic states, a so-called Fermi arc. That's what the theory predicts. But the measured electronic structure of this phase here since the early 1990s has had a large gap near the zone phase and an arc in the middle of the Brion zone. So the gap structure of a pair density wave is highly consistent with the gap structure of the pseudo gap phase. Good. Now, the detailed spectral function, that's um, the imaginary part of G k of omega for theorists, the Green's function for uh, delocalized electrons moving through this environment, has been measured for many years. Patrick Lee pointed out in 2014 that the electronic structure as measured is completely consistent with, uh, sorry, is completely inconsistent with this being a charge density wave but it's highly consistent with this state being a pair density wave. He pointed out that this state is very likely from the spectral function to be a pair density wave. Furthermore, uh, when you turn on a high magnetic field here, there's uh, powerful quantum oscillations, closed orbit electronic oscillations of electrons in the material in high magnetic field. And the area of those oscillations in, in real or in reciprocal space is measured with high precision. It's very tiny in reciprocal space and really no valid theory of why that should happen has been put forward until this paper by Mike Norman in which he showed 
that if this phase is a pair density wave, then the orbit of the electrons um, in the quantum oscillations comes out at correct, the correct value with no adjustable parameters. It's an amazing result. I, I love it. So quantum oscillations are highly consistent with this being a pair density wave state. Of course, you know, to get the tiny um, area of quantum oscillations in momentum space, you need a broken symmetry. So the proposal is that to produce that tiny area, the broken symmetry is a pair density wave. And finally, you know, we know that this isn't a translationally invariant whole dope spin liquid from our own work. <laughs> we can see that it breaks in the charge channel, translational and rotational symmetry. And in the pair channel, it breaks translational symmetry as well. So many, many phenomena here are internally consistent with a picture of this state being a pair density wave, the pseudo gap state, electronic dark matter. Now, I must not oversell this proposal because there is one major uh, issue still on the table. If I write the order parameter for a pair density wave, it modulates the pair field periodically in space. Everything I've shown you here is consistent with this, but it also breaks gauge symmetry. It's a superconductor. Pair density waves should superconduct electrical current with no dissipation. And the pseudo gap is not a superconductor. So uh, the logical possibilities are either A, the pseudogap is a pair density wave with phase fluctuations. I would vote for that possibility. Or another logical possibility is that this hypothesis is incorrect. And it's just a coincidence that all these other phenomena support the idea of a pair density wave. But the jury is out. In fact, the jury has not even heard these evidence until very recently. Uh, it still remains to be seen whether this state here could be a phase fluctuating pair density wave. If it is a phase fluctuating pair density wave, then the whole phase diagram of the cuprates is understood within the same Hamiltonian, the TJ model, strong coupling, whole dope spin liquid. And at least at the level of the phase diagram, that would represent the solution of the cuprate problem. Okay, so that's what we still need to do in order to uh, finally come to the conclusion of this odyssey. So for the future, Here's the enormous investment that Oxford University has made in a wide variety of experimental physics, including our own. Down here, 30 meters underground, there are three ultra low vibration laboratories in the B3 and B2 floor of the Beecroft building. And we're building instruments in them right now. So down here, uh, we're building an instrument. It's about, um, so this is four, so this is the floor level of the lab. So four meters high in the lab, but under the floor, there's another uh, three meter high massive concrete block on vibration isolators to render this microscope isolated, perf should be perfectly isolated from the outside world. And these are installed down here in the th B3 level of Beecroft. So into the, one of the instruments we've designed, it's called Gemini, it's under construction right now. It's a millikelvin scan Josephson tunneling microscope with atomic resolution niobium tips. We have validated all of the technical components of this design. Uh, if the labs are working, we're pretty sure the design will work. Oh, and this has all been built. Uh, so here are the three labs. Uh, the Gemini microscope is going in this lab, which should be the quietest lab of all in the corner. Uh, components have all been built in the physics machine shop, which is absolutely wonderful. It's been a delightful experience to have them building our instruments. And they've also been assembling the instrument in situ in Beecroft now during October 2020. So we hope to get the first machine on the air, uh, hopefully touch wood sometime early next year. And uh, here's the team of colleagues who are working uh, on visualizing electron pair fluids and crystals. Uh, in the Beecroft Lab at Oxford University. And on their behalf, thanks very much for listening to me today.